from Lexington Gardens in Lexington, Massachusetts, and Rogers Garden Center in Newport Beach, California, the Victory Garden. Funding for the Victory Garden is provided by this station and other public television stations, and by W.R. Grace and Company, makers of Peter's Professional Plant Food, Potting Soil, and New Peter's Liquid Concentrated Plant Food for all home gardening needs, both indoors and out. By America's largest producer of container-grown plants, Monrovia Nursery Company, supplying garden centers and local nurseries nationwide. And by the Mantis Manufacturing Company, mail-order distributors of the Mantis 20, the 20-pound home tiller and cultivator. Hello, I'm Bob Thompson, and welcome to the Victory Garden. Today we'll be heading out to California to catch up with Bob's mouse in the Victory Garden West. And Marion will be along with a recipe for radicchio. And then it's a special treat. We'll be going down under to New Zealand, where our British friend Peter Seabrook is waiting to take us on a tour of some of their fabulous gardens. But first, let me show you what's happened here in this garden. We had a heavy frost last night. I mean, the temperature went down to below 25 degrees. And our winter rye is totally frosted over with real icy crystals. But that winter rye is really tough and strong. And as long as the ground itself isn't frozen, the winter rye will keep growing. But over here, look at the cold frame. It really is a cold frame today. It's just crusted over with ice and frost. But inside, look at that, a beautiful crop of butterhead lettuce. That's the way it ought to be done. Well, while it's frosty cold here in New England, it's springtime in New Zealand. And I think our friend Peter Seabrook is just about getting off the plane. Well, Bob, we're 9,000 miles from Boston in Auckland, New Zealand's largest city. Some 20 hours up in the air, and I don't know quite what happened. We lost Thursday when we crossed the Dateline. And when we left the northeastern states with that beautiful autumn fall color and arrive in the southern hemisphere, suddenly it's spring. Well, to let the system get used to those uh, minor shocks, we're taking the rest of the day off so that we'll be up tomorrow morning fighting fit to show you those marvelous gardens that make this long journey so worthwhile. Well, you can just see the peak of Mount Egmont there in the background as we go to visit a very special garden. It's just one of two that's been selected good enough to be taken on by the New Zealand National Trust. I suppose we can best compare that with the National Park Service in the States, but in Britain we have a National Trust too. It's where private properties and big areas of land are taken on in perpetuity for the nation. You know, they can't be interfered with, and usually the person who uh, had the property or developed the garden lives on uh, in the premises, so it is a sort of private garden. And that's exactly what we have here. Started in 1932, and it's called Tapari. Fortunately, it's a Maori word, which means garland of flowers. I haven't got my New Zealand dollars. It's all right, is it, just to go in? OK, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> and really, we could take the main drive down to the house, but I think we'll take the garden walk. It's really very steep and quite a narrow, windy lane. But you come on, look in here. If we get into the trees, it's like a cathedral, these great pillars, the trunks of the trees going up. And you need to remember that all of the plantings we're going to see here today have been since 1932. Oh, and this has a nice sort of soft tread to it. You can smell the pines. Oh, yes. Here we get just a first taste of what this garden's all about. You see the layers of it. I mean, first of all, that little acer, the orange young foliage now, variety called Chisio, and then the rhododendrons, and it lays right the way down to the Copper Beach into the valley. But come on, you know, there's so much to see here. Very skillful planting. It's the tremendous variety of texture of leaves and flowers that's uh, the beauty here, and a very steep slope. More than 200 feet from the road down to the valley below. And when Sir Russell and Lady Matthews first came here, it was just a, a rough hillside covered with blackberries and gorse. I mean, gorse, that's a really prickly, miserable weed that's very invasive. It seeds everywhere. But this colour the year round, I mean, on the banks here, we've got the mop head hydrangeas. Oh, and just look at the size of this tree. 
looks like cryptomeria. That's uh, you know one of the main Japanese timber trees. I've never seen anything quite so big as that. Look at the look at the size of it. In just 50 or so years. And fa fancy gardening on, on slopes as steep as this. How on earth do they retain the soil? Oh yes, and I've heard about this. This, this is the Avenue of Lawson's that was planted to give some wind protection uh, to the hillside here. And actually, uh, Sir Russell's daughter, she complained that uh, as they grew up, it screened the view from her window. She couldn't see Mount Egmont anymore. Oh yes. Oh, here's, here's a beauty. Look at this, this rather spindly sort of looking uh, branch framework. Here is, is the uh, involucrata, the handkerchief tree. And the, well, they're not really flowers. There are two large bracts, rather like the poinsettia, and the, and the flowers are just a little sort of black dot hidden up in between those bracts. Oh yes, but come on, look, the, the whole feel and the nature of uh, the garden changes almost at every corner. We can, we can see beneath here that to Acer there's, there's the uh, green one and, and then that Chisio we were looking at oh, with the sun shining through it. Absolutely beautiful. And, and then it's as if we were creeping off back into these sort of subtropical rainforests with the great ferns growing everywhere. Oh yes, and I, I love the way that the ground is absolutely covered, you know, with the little selaginellas. Oh yes, and, and, the, and the little oxalis. It's amazing really how the banks hold, they're so steep. Oh, and the ferns here. That sort of black stems. That real sort of foresty, damp, sort of cool smell. Oh yes. Now it was this point, I think, where the only tree existed when they first came to the site here. Uh, all the trees have been planted, other than this one. Uh, it's cut down now, made just a little planting space. The gardener was uh, telling us before we actually came in. Oh yes, absolutely magnificent. Look, look here at the view across. You can see uh, the pale-leaved acer and the copper beech and then right the way through to the pasture beyond. And this is the place, <laughs> yes you can see even better now, how, how that uh, Davidia gets its common name ghost tree. If you can imagine those white bracts blowing in the breeze just as it starts to get dusk, could look pretty ghostly. And, and dove tree is another common name, I suppose they do look almost like doves. Uh, it was just cool weather that made it to flower so well, they think, this year. And the rhododendrons, beautiful, great. Fragrant clusters there, and the size of them. And then on, on, on the bank, the much richer and stronger deciduous azaleas. And then back into ferns again, I mean, it just keeps changing so quickly. Oh, now, now, yes, I can get a whiff of those deciduous azaleas here. That's one of the beauties of them, the, fl the flowers are lovely and fragrant. And not only that, once the flowers have fallen, uh, in the autumn, the leaf has brilliant colours too, before they fall. Oh, and this is an interesting little group of trees here too. This, this is a, a native tree, the Rimu, absolutely beautiful timber. They cut endless of trees. They need to be really four or five hundred years to get the full beauty of them. And the timber then is very rich, mahogany coloured. But unfortunately they've been so heavily cut uh, that there are very few left now in the North Island and they're having to plant again. But it's going to be four or five hundred years, I suppose, before they can be harvested again. Oh yes, and as we stop here on the steps, it, it just reminds me that uh, Sir Russell Matthews, he was a road constructor. He was the first chap to build Tarmac Adam Roads in New Zealand and his staff, when they hadn't got roads to build, will be in the garden here actually doing this paths and this beautiful brick edging. Very good construction work here. But if you're gardening here, I think I'll just about put some stress on the thighs by the end of the day. It's really steep. Some lovely work too on steps and gateways with the this brick, forget-me-nots too for underplanting, and here the guest, I think it's the caretaker who lives here in the cottage, and what a beautiful view they have first thing in the morning when they come at the front door, and detailed planting too on the edge here. The Japanese 
azaleas flowering and the plant again with those forget-me-not they'll keep self-seeding come up year after year and right on the edge that little viola tumbling over the brickwork and I think it's the way those mosses and algae grow that really give that red brick something special but what about these guarding the entrance a lovely shape indescribable these aces and the branches come layer after layer acer palmatum that's because the leaves are palm shaped dissectum because they're cut and then of course purpurea in purple and coming up through it no it's not a weed don't go touching that that's the lilies good combination lilies because they'll flower high summer when the aces are not quite as attractive as in spring and autumn and then beneath this the purpureum then we're back into chisio again what a lovely combination that too and mirror reflection another two this size slightly different colors marvelous form this one look yes just they're just coming into flower look there'll be the keys on the wind come the autumn who knows what the new varieties they'll bring but it is these purple cut leaves that oh, they are absolutely gorgeous plants and the way they grow they stand on guard <laughs> for another marvelous view look at that cornice we've come just the right day for that too perfect uh, again bracts with the little tiny flowers in the center and, and if you check right inside growing up the trunk there are the epiphytes spores on the wind hit the trunk and it's so moist there everywhere that uh, they just grow and spread up through the branches and then we've got the traditional twice season planting and all oh, this is that lovely anemone mona lisa such long stems lovely thing for cutting that and it just flowers and flowers just the climate here for it yeah. oh yes and this this is the sort of place to see that copper beach what a beauty marvelous there good autumn color on that and here it's almost like a garden room with the rose arch and, and the and the flower buds absolutely masses I don't know whether it's a variety called seagull or kifskate will be just another week or two before that comes into flower and it'll be a mass of flowers too all those thorny branches intertwined it's really cool i think strolling under here on a summer evening but uh, hello and a lovely garden isn't it i can't help but admire the stonework the skill of it you know the way that it's just three different rectangular stones there but beautiful craftsmanship and now we're into another little rectangle but these this layer after layer of color i mean you see the lime green of yet another acer stretching right up the banks foreground here of roses they're looking forward to their roses come a november and the rhododendrons in full flower again oh, oh, oh. those bricklayers they just take my breath away cineraria is under planting I know it's a pot plant, it's remarkable to see it here as bedding, but you can see every tourist, can't you, you know, posing at the garden gate to have their photograph taken. I think I'm almost in the way, you know, you really just need to uh, savour that for a minute. It is, I think, an artist's dream. And you can just imagine, too, the bricklayer with his timber arch setting every brick in place. Well, now the tour really ends here for visitors, but you know what we television people are. I'm afraid where it says no entry we just slip through the rope we have permission actually because there's something i want to show you through here oh yes before i do I have to point out these uh, stately scots pines absolutely huge and they're right on the hillside planted because the root is deep and goes straight down to give great anchorage and just beneath them there's the bamboos which help to filter out those gales too on rough windy august days but it's through here through the gate There, isn't that a breath of New Zealand? I can just see a few little cracks of white, most of the mountain hidden there under the clouds. But there's that rolling pasture land down to the river, 200 feet, that the garden stretches down to. This is one of the most popular visitor's spots, and I'm not surprised they popped a seat there. It's in just the right place. As you sit down, it's like a painting. In the distance those bright deciduous azaleas again and it's not a hedge that's just the very fine leaved creeping fig tumbling over the bank there and then the water feature 
but there's a rather special story about the waterfall. I'd like to show that to you. This is pretty well a textbook example of how to build a water garden. And if we start with the biggest top pool, perfectly still and how clear the water is, and those blue iris sibirica just coming into flower, opening in the last day or two. And then the water lilies, give those a month or so and they'll be in flower. And then we come to the first of a whole series of very natural little waterfalls running through these rock faces and the primulas. This is the variety Heldoxa. We call them the candelabra types because up the stem the flowers come in whorls just like a candelabra. And the planting very carefully and tastefully done, that hosta, undulata aurea, and then the purple primula too, another one of those candelabra types. Absolutely reveling in that moisture. They love that for a cool sort of root run. But the point that I really wanted to make was the construction of the rock faces. If you look right in underneath that small green ivy, you can see where the rocks are. And Russell, he was a crafty old devil. He invited all his friends for a picnic and then took them up to the local quarry. And they actually numbered every stone in position. And they spent a pretty sweaty day, I'm told, hauling those stones onto the back of a lorry, brought them here, and they were rebuilt in exactly the same position as they were uh, originally out in the wild. And that's the way you get this very natural sort of feel. And here we are into the third little waterfall and the water adjusted so that they get the flow to look as it would in nature. This is the Elizabeth Garden and it's the closest one to the house. When people step out this is the thing they look down to and some of the finest specimens of those cut-leaved aces. This specimen, one of the finest I've seen, was actually given to the Matthews by the New Plymouth Parks Department. It's over 60 years old. It's a beautiful plant. And very tasteful planting continued. I mean, that group of hostas, four varieties, the big uh, glauca type and the variegated leaves, beautiful hostas. And then another one. <laughs> it doesn't seem fair that somebody should have a nice little fountain and a second Ace are growing so big with a layer after layer of foliage. We need to keep them quite well protected uh, in most of our own home gardens. They don't like those cold winds in spring. And here we can see the pool opening up, a lovely oval uh, water feature. And actually the goldfish, they're, they're just starting to respond to a little of my gentle feeding of cookies. I'm not sure whether it's right, but they seem to like to come up to the crumbs. It's a thing that uh, Sir Russell didn't like at all. He used to frighten the goldfish back under the aces because he thought the colour clashed with the foliage. <laughs> well, I shouldn't think they clashed with the green viridus here, but you do get a sight of the house. Imagine waking first thing in the morning if you're up on the top bedroom with the wrought iron balustrade and looking out across to Mount Egmont or down into this. Well, it's a gardener's paradise. Every window pretty, pretty well would uh, look down into this little enclave. Keen plantsmen, I think, will be jumping out first thing in the morning. Have a look at this. I mean, here's another cut leaf day. So this time it has variegated foliage, pink and cream. It has a Japanese name, Higasayama. Uh, that too will have uh, good autumn colours. And it's a very popular place coming and standing here if you have a wedding. And I should think if the bride and groom can get under the arch here, <laughs> must be the perfect place to start a new life. And if the groom's got a bit of interest in gardening, you'd probably go nipping in here too, look. There'd be a flower for the bride's hair. Clematis nellimosa. It grows very well actually on a north-facing wall, except you have to remember here in the southern hemisphere, it's south-facing walls that are more shaded. You get much stronger coloured barring if it uh, is protected from the sun. But I think this is the place to take uh, our farewells. Absolutely marvellous garden. Doesn't matter where you live, must be worth those thousands of miles to come and pay this a visit, especially in the spring and the autumn when it's quite magnificent. That estate garden called Tupari was really a beautiful place, Peter. I'm looking forward to seeing more of those wonderful gardens in the weeks ahead. 
but back here in this garden, there's a plant that I want you to see. It's one of my favorites, and it's called the Anchianthus. And you can see that it has a very nice fall color, which is typical to many plants in the New England area at this time of the year. Some of the stems, the new growth, you can see the stems are quite red, and of course they play off nicely against the white snow that we get so much of in the New England area. And the bonus is small white bell-like flowers in the spring, and all of these things together make this a fine plant for the home landscape. Now, let's head out to sunny Southern California and see Bob Smouse, who's waiting to show us around the Victory Garden West. Welcome to a delightfully wet Victory Garden West here at Rogers Gardens. We've had our first rain already, and that means the end of the dry season and the beginning of fall. And the best thing about fall is that it's a great planting season in Southern California. You can plant anything at this time of the year. You can plant trees, you can plant shrubs, ground covers, lawns, vegetables, flowers, bulbs, you name it, you can plant it. You could start an entire garden from scratch if you wanted to right now. And speaking of shrubs, let me show you one of my favorite. This is the Aust Australian tea tree, Leptospermum. This is its botanical name. And it's blooming early right now, but it gives you a chance to see what it would look like later in the year. The real value of this shrub is that it blooms in the dead of winter. This particular variety has nice pale white flowers with a little peachy interior. Looks a lot like an apple blossom. The variety in back of me has a rich ruby uh, color. In fact, it's named Ruby Glow. And further up the path, we have a pink variety that falls somewhere in between. Now these shrubs are fast growing, but they can take a fair amount of pruning. Here's the pink. You can see you don't want to prune all of this off, however, because this willowy form, bent over a little bit by the recent rain here, is one of its chief uh, attributes. Further down the path, we have still another Australian that you could also plant now. In fact, these were only planted a year ago, and they're doing respectably well. This is our equivalent of the eastern birch tree, only this is another Australian plant called the Kajaput, or Melaleuca quinquinervia. Like a birch, it has nice willowy foliage, except ours is evergreen. And like a birch, it has wonderful bark. Look at this squishy stuff. Cats love this. They love to dig their claws into it and hang on. It even peels off like birch bark. Another thing you can do in the fall is tidy up the garden. And we need to do that to our perennial garden here. Perennials are a, a, a new topic for us here in California. We haven't grown them for long, and we're still learning a lot about them. One thing we've discovered already is that most perennial beds look better seen from a little distance. Up close, they begin to fall apart a little, especially at this time of the year. The rosemary up there still looks good. The lavender looks good. The lamb's ears looks good until you get up close, and you can see that something's been nibbling at it, probably at night, because we haven't seen it. We'll have to come out with a flashlight and see what's doing the damage. Something that drives me crazy has happened to our salvia leucantha here. This happens to a lot of perennials in California because they grow so fast and so lushly during our mild uh, spring and summer. This grew up, got top heavy, and fell over. And now the whole inside has become in, uh, is bare of leaves and, and needs cutting back drastically. We'll cut that right back to the ground, but we'll probably wait a little bit for the flowers to fade. Of course, the other thing you can do in Southern California at this time of the year is plant color. In fact, that's what most people associate fall with, is the planting of color. This bed here is probably the first thing you see when you walk into the Victory Garden West. So it has to be a knockout bed. It's got to be full of color. We were first going to plant these chrysanthemums, these little bedding chrysanthemums from four-inch pots. Uh, but then we thought maybe we should plant bulbs. Unfortunately, we can't do both, because if you plant the bulbs with the, the uh, bedding plants, you'll have to water the bulbs too much and they'll rot. So it's either or. We've decided to plant the bulbs, and the bulbs we're going to plant are ranunculus. This is Southern California's favorite bulb, but if you haven't seen them before, let me show them to you. Look at those funny little things. They're actually tubers, and they look like browned bunches of bananas. And you plant them with these little points facing down. There's not much to planting these things. Let me plant a few for you here. 
scatter them about so we remember where they're going to go. They only need to be about six inches apart. And this is all you do to plant one. Hardly like planting a tulip or a daffodil, is it? They should only be covered with an inch of soil, no more. I could plant the whole bed in about five minutes. Now from these little funny looking tubers will sprout probably the most spectacular of all bulb flowers. They're really beautiful. Nothing pale or, or um, uh, shy about these flowers. They're vibrant, vibrant colors. Yellows, oranges, pinks. Some are picotees, which means they have a white edge around the side of them. They are spectacular. Right now they don't look like much, but come back in fe February and they'll knock your socks off. Bob, I'm really pleased with our fall crop of radicchio. You can see that I've been growing four plants in this terracotta container. The leaves of the radicchio are often used as a garnish, but it's the tender pink and white hearts that Marion's looking for for today's recipe. What a luxury it is to grow your own radicchio. It's so expensive in the market. I love to use it in the salad, and it deserves a very special vinaigrette. Here in this bowl, I have a teaspoon of Dijon mustard and one clove of garlic that I've minced with a little bit of salt. I'm going to add a good red wine vinegar, about three tablespoons, and a few drops of that sweet balsamic vinegar. That's a nice addition. And then a half a cup of a very good virgin olive oil. And once that's all mixed together, one more addition, a few chopped shallots. And that's all there is to the dressing. Over here is my radicchio. Look at that beautiful color. But it's a little sharp to have it all by itself, so I like to go for some of the milder greens, like spinach, impeccably washed and dried, and endive, those beautiful light-colored spears. And now I'm going to just set that aside, and when I'm ready to serve it, I'll dress it. Radicchio salad sprinkled with fresh mushrooms. Save this for a very special occasion. Next time, we'll be heading to beautiful British Columbia, where we'll visit the magnificent Bouchard Gardens. That's next time on The Victory Garden. Funding for The Victory Garden is provided by this station and other public television stations, and by W.R. Grayson Company, makers of Peter's Professional Plant Food, Potting Soil, and New Peter's Liquid Concentrated Plant Food for all home gardening needs, both indoors and out. By America's largest producer of container-grown plants, Monrovia Nursery Company, supplying garden centers and local nurseries nationwide. And by the Mantis Manufacturing Company, mail-order distributors of the Mantis 20, the 20-pound 20 home tiller and cultivator.